Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out for today's workshop. Um, we are really happy to have Eleanor Dixon, uh, Dixon Cole from the Hockey Trust Research Center here to join us to conduct this workshop. Um, this workshop is a part of the Data and Computational Science series that was funded through the Provost Office and is being facilitated by UC Libraries and IT at UC. So thank you to the Provost for putting this on and for the food that will be coming later today. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about Eleanor and then I'll let her um, explain the workshop that she's going to conduct. So Eleanor is the uh, Digital Scholarship Librarian at the Hathi Trust and she's the Associate Director for Outreach and Education for the Hathi Trust Research Center. She leads outreach and training for the Hathi Trust Research Center and provides reference and support for scholars engaged in computational text analysis with the Hathi Trust Corpus and she has a Master's of Science and in Information Studies degree from the University of Texas at Austin. So, Eleanor, thank you for coming to Cincinnati and for conducting the workshop. Yeah, yeah. all right. So we'll spend the first little bit of time this morning um, easing into things. Um, so we'll take it easy for the first 15 minutes or so, making sure that we are set up and ready to go through the materials together. So it looks like everyone has a handout. Um, you'll want to make sure that you're accessing the workshop materials. You don't. Uh, I think they're on the table outside. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, you'll want to you want to go to this link here, which is U of I dot box dot com forward slash v forward slash u of Cincinnati 2019. I should have made the URL shorter. Um, that's where you can get the slides. Ah. Does anyone else need a handout? I think everyone else has one. No one else hollered. <coughs> Okay, so from this box link is where you can get the materials that we'll be using today, including the slide deck. There's a second slide deck from the talk that I gave yesterday afternoon, which has um, some of the same material we'll be going over in our introduction, but a little bit more context um, in case you wanted to look at that. You'll also find um, some activity files and also a link to um, the GitHub that we'll be using to go through to run some of the activities. You don't need to download any of those activity files right now. I put them in there in case you wanted to have access to them. Everything that we're going to be doing today is web-based, but just in case you wanted to have an easy spot to download those files, they are there for you in a box. So the other thing that you need to do is make sure that you can log in to the Hathi Trust Digital Library. So that's at hathitrust.org. Um, if you're a University of Cincinnati person, then you should be able to log in with your campus credentials. Um, and then you'll want to create an account for HTRC Analytics, and that's at analytics.hattitrust.org. Um, your University of Cincinnati email address should work for you to do that. If you run into any troubles, just flag me down and let me know. Um, you do need to use the university email, though. You can't use your Gmail or a Yahoo account or anything like that. Um, I'll warn you now that to create an account for this site, you have to enter in a 15-character password. I am sorry. That's like the worst part of the workshop today. Um, that's a rule for all of IU, so don't blame me. Blame Indiana University. Yeah. Good for IU. Yeah, so everything is 15 characters and everything's two-factor. So, yeah, they take it seriously, the security of getting into stuff. Yeah. Um, but that is one of the most common complaints I hear. <laughs> All right, so make sure that you can do those things. If you're having trouble, raise your hand. I'll circulate around and see if I can uh, help you out. Is anyone done with setup and ready to go? Okay, I'll ask again in about five minutes. I think you have to leave the www off. You do. Oh, of this of one? Analytics. Ah, okay. Yeah. Good, good point. Just go to analytics.hathitrust.org. Thanks. So this one's on the handout. Ah, yep. You'll get an authentication email for the analytics site. Make sure that you check your email and authenticate your account. You have 12 hours to do it, but then after 12 hours, the link is dead. But you'll need it within 12 hours today. So. Okay, so anybody who's done with setup, does anyone want to volunteer what you're hoping to get out of the workshop today? Any brave <coughs> souls? Helps me figure out 
the audience, what your interests are. So I'm going to go off on some tangent. So you too many unrelated stories. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm looking at doing a dissertation that uh, does nonlinear analysis on conversation data. So okay. both on text and also potentially on audio. OK, great. Sounds interesting. Yeah, anybody else want to volunteer a, a reason why they're here today? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Go ahead. So I look at uh, urban renewal data from like the 1930s and the 1940s. Oh, interesting. Um, I was hoping to kind of find more information and also do some text mining with the to try to find out uh, everything that I can find. Great. Yeah. Sounds interesting. Yeah, go ahead. I look at uh, political materials, public speaking, uh, letters to the editor. <laughs> And, um, stuff cool, yep, great. Anybody else want to volunteer to share what they're hoping to get out of today or what their interests are? Yep, go ahead. I work for a researcher who does um, autoimmune disease research. Okay. We occasionally analyze scientific research papers uh -huh. for keywords. Okay. And we don't know anything about this stuff. Cool. For real. We're trained in other things, so I was hoping to pick up a few. Okay, great. Anybody else? Okay, is anybody stuck on logging in and needs an extra pair of eyes to get them going? I haven't gotten the email yet. It so might take a few minutes. For some okay. reason, it was taking folks a little longer than usual to get the email this morning. Okay, that's how it always is, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'll say, too, I'm waiting. Okay. Okay. Didn't work for me. How long ago did you? Sorry, Oh, 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 yeah, okay, well, I, best wishes. Okay, all right, so I can tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm Eleanor Dixon Kale. As Amy said, I'm the uh, Digital Scholarship Librarian at Hathi Trust and the Associate Director for Outreach and Education for the Research Center. This is my email address. I hope that you all will keep in touch after the workshop. If you have questions or you want to talk about the materials in more detail, um, that's what I'm here for, is to help answer some of those questions. All right, so here's our schedule for today. Um, we'll start with an introduction. Some of this repeats material that I talked about yesterday. Um, so for those of you who are sitting through it twice, I'm sorry, um, but hopefully that extra boost will um, uh, keep you going through it. We're gonna talk about hot to trust collections, work sets, and data sets, um, how those three pieces are the same, but also different from one another. Uh, we're gonna talk about analyzing hot to trust data in two, maybe three ways. The first is using a data set that's called Extracted Features, um, and we'll be working in Python for that set of activities. Um, and then we're going to pop into an HTRC data capsule, um, and you guys are going to, um, if you choose, uh, do a little bit of topic modeling. Um, if you don't want to do that, you can choose your own adventure and use one of the off-the-shelf algorithms to do some analysis, and then we'll do a bit of wrap-up. Okay, so um, I'll do the like three minute version of the introduction to text mining. Um, but if we want to spend more time on this piece, we can. Um, if you don't want to talk about this, somebody just shake your head vociferously in the back and be like, this is awful, move on. Okay, but here's three minutes introduction to uh, text data mining. So text data mining is using computers to reveal information in and about text. Um, so generally the text is unstructured, by which we mean that we're talking about free text. So um, not highly structured, say, in a database. Um, and we use computer algorithms to discern patterns within the text. Um, and it really is about more than just search. So we're not so much interested in trying to discern whether or not um, the work Moby Dick contains the word whale. Um, but we might want to try to figure out what the use of a term like that tells us something about Melville or about the way that the work was written or about the genre of the work. Um, so we're trying to do a little bit more than just uncovering the existence of something, but trying to really dig into those patterns and see what they tell us about the work. In order to do text data mining, there, there is this is one workflow that I'll present for it. Um, the first thing that you generally need to do is first break the text data into smaller pieces. 
So if you have unstructured text, you have this blob, right, of textual material, and then you're going to break it up into smaller pieces <coughs> that then you can abstract and ask the computer to count. So computers are good at counting in particular. So if you get the text into a form where it can be counted and you can do statistics, um, then you can start to infer some of that information about the text itself. So you might be counting things like words or phrases or parts of speech, and then you use those counts to do computational statistics, and then you develop hy hypotheses based on um, whatever results that you get. So oftentimes I'm doing these workshops um, for a librarian or a humanities audience um, who are um, at times new to thinking about text mining um, as an avenue for their research. Um, so especially thinking about um, that humanities perspective, um, we can think about text data mining giving us the opportunity to have a shift in our perspective about how we're approaching our research. So the shift in perspective leads to a shift in research questions. So you can start to ask new kinds of research questions using text mining that you wouldn't have been able to do um, by human reading alone. Um, sometimes, especially in digital humanities, this is called distant reading, although um, that's just one term for it. Um, often it's just one step in the research process, so um, especially this is important for people who feel a little squicky about the computers doing the work. It's not like click a button, get results, you move on. Um, oftentimes you're moving back and forth between the original text itself and your analysis. Um, and um, I've heard this called intermediate reading or distant close reading. So there is that interplay, the, the back and forth that's going on. You're not giving the computer all of the agency to do the computer, um, the thinking for you. So some of the things that text data mining can open up are questions that aren't provable by human reading alone, uh, larger corpora for analysis, and then studies that cover larger time spans. So um, if you're a student who, a graduate student who's being asked to read 300 journal articles a week um, by using computational methods, you might be able to ease the process of doing that kind of lit review. Or say uh, you're an English faculty member and you want to study 19th century literature, it would be really hard for you to read independently everything that was written over the course of a century. And so um, by using computers to aid your research, then you can um, facilitate that process. OK, so um, the, I think this is the only piece of the day where I'm going to force you to talk to the person sitting next to you. Um, so if you go to this URL, go.illinois.edu forward slash DDRF dash research dash examples, read only the last example. There's three there. Don't read all of them. Just read the last one. Um, and then in pairs or small groups, so person sitting next to you, person sitting behind you, um, talk about these questions. How do the projects involve change over time, pattern recognition, or comparative analysis? What kind of text data did they use? So what um, time period does it represent? What was the source? And then what were their findings? So again, don't read all three of the research examples, uh, but it should be the last one, which is the emergence of literary diction. So spend maybe five minutes doing that, and then we'll have a brief discussion. OK, so any questions about setup? OK, so let's take a look at this example together. Um, so uh, this comes from a paper called The Emergence of Literary Diction that was written by Ted Underwood and Jordan Sellers in 2012, which seems so recent when I started using this as an example in workshops, but it was six years ago now or more. Okay, so uh, Ted and Jordan were asking what textual characteristics constitute literary language. So what kinds of words are used in literature versus in other kinds of writing? Um, and they were looking at a very long time span. So they were studying from um, a little after 1700 or right around 1700 up through, um, I think they stopped at 1900. And um, so this is one um, graph from the paper. And you can see on the y-axis the ratio of old words to new words. And the x-axis shows the years. So the graph is showing word age over time. 
So the words that were used in poetry, drama, and fiction are shown in purple. And then the nonfiction prose is shown in dark gray. And then the graph is showing the gradual increase in the use of new words in both categories until about 1775, when older words began to be more prevalent in um, poetry, drama, and fiction. So they're showing that whereas earlier in time, these genres tended to use the same kinds of words, there's a split that happens so that um, nonfiction prose tends to use words that have entered the English language more recently, whereas poetry, drama, and fiction were using words that had been around for longer. So this is just one example of a research project that made use of data from the HathiTrust Digital Library, and is one example of the kinds of text analysis projects that you can embark on using this massive digital library as a data source. Does anyone have any questions about um, Ted and Jordan's project? Okay. All right, how many of you are familiar with HathiTrust? Okay, great. So um, HathiTrust is a digital <laughs> library. It is a preservation repository. Um, and it, it's a partnership of member institutions. So it has roots in the Google Books Project, so it was founded in 2008, um, and it exists as a separate entity from Google Books, though. It lives at the University of Michigan, um, and it grew out of this large-scale digitization initiative at academic libraries. Um, so the digital library continues to grow every year um, as members continue to scan materials and submit them to the digital library. The library does not do any scanning itself. All of the content is being submitted from members, and it is reflective of an academic library collection. Um, so that means while there is quite a bit of things like fiction or other um, sort of like humanities works in there, there's lots of GovDocs and other materials, and I'll touch on a few of those as we go through. So there are, are 140 partner institutions, primarily in the US, although um, there are some in Canada, Australia, um, and then a few in Europe, and maybe one in Japan, although I don't know if they're a partner or a contributor. But they are mostly in the US, but there are um, other international partners as well. And the University of Cincinnati is a partner in Hathi Trust. So um, by virtue of being um, at the University of Cincinnati, then you are afforded a few additional benefits for working with the digital library materials, although the library is uh, uh, accessible to the public. So the digital library um, contains 16.9 million volumes. And by volume, I mean something that could be picked up off a library shelf and scanned as a discrete object. So it might be a novel, it might be a single issue of a journal, or it might be um, a year's worth of um, journal publications that were bound together. There are things like, um, uh, let's see, musical scores, there's a few musical scores in there, there's some newspapers, but really it's focused on book-like objects. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes though. So you've been to this website already to make sure that you could log in, but using the digital library website, you have the capability to search and read, um, read in the public domain, and to build collections of text from the digital library. And you log in using your university credentials. So anybody anywhere using the digital library can read public domain and open access works via the web, search across the full text of the entire collection via the web, receive a data set of public domain content under certain conditions, or, which is what you're here for today, mine text and data from the entire collection using the um, Hathi Trust Research Center. Members or affiliates of member institutions can um, download public domain and open access works, provide access to their users who are blind or who have print disabilities, get access to replacements for lost or damaged print copies, and mine data from the entire collection via a system called HTRC data capsules. Did you have a question? Yeah, um, it might not be relevant for this, but I'm just wondering, do you have any like standards um, from the member institutions as it relates to resolution. Like yes. 600 PPI, 300, the FAGI uh, ratings, uh, things like that. Yes, um, there are standards for submission. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head because I'm not part of the submission process. There is documentation that I can dig up for you during one of the breaks that's on the website in terms of the specifications that the materials have to follow. 
it seems the quality of the documents vary greatly. Yes, yeah, there is, I think, a lower limit. And then there are some materials that were scanned in black and white, which can make it so that the um, quality is lessened. Yeah. All right, so um, if we're going to think about this massive um, digital library as a data source, um, then it is important to know uh, what's in our, our data, right? So around 50% of the material is in English, although um, there are a handful or more than a handful of materials in German and Spanish and French, I think, are the next top three. And then it starts to peter off from there. Um, there are lots of languages, though, in the digital library. Um, one thing that you might find as you go through is that there are um, some sticky things that can happen um, when you start dealing with non-Roman characters. Um, so that's just something to look out for, and I won't dive too deep into that during the introduction. So about 63% of the materials are in copyright or of status unknown. Um, and that means that they are not available for reading um, through the digital library. Whether you're logged in or not, whether you're a member or not, we don't provide access for reading to the end copyright materials due to um, the strictures of copyright law. Um, the items are scanned from book-like materials, like I mentioned, so that's um, what I was talking about, where there's musical scores, say, but there's no audio-visual materials. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, a few newspapers, but if you're looking for newspaper data, there are much better data sources out there for you. Um, and the um, materials come from the 15th through the 21st century, although there is a concentration in the 20th century. And that has to do with digitization priorities at member libraries, so they have to choose what's getting scanned. And also the fact that many more things started to be published in the 20th century. There's sort of a cliff that I think is around 1980, 1990 in the digital library. Um, so there are things in there that were published between 1990 and the present day, uh, but the concentration tends to be closer to the beginning of the 20th century. And there's a mix of genres. Um, you can access statistics that are updated daily, um, which is sort of fun to see the library as it grows. So one example of a particular content set in the digital library is US federal government documents. And I wanted to especially highlight those materials with this audience because I have a feeling that many of you are not humanities faculty or PhD students. Is that true? That it's maybe a wider group than that? OK, well, my um, colleague in, uh, at the Hathi Trust who works with FedDocs says there's a FedDoc for everything. I think that's true. So the FedDocs collection is really varied and interesting in terms of what it contains. Um, it has um, nearly a million uh, separate digital objects, which is pretty cool. Um, and over the last few years, they set out on a project to try to identify all US federal government documents ever created and then do some back scanning to see if they could fill gaps in the collection. Um, so if you are interested in learning more about the gut docs, I put a couple links in the slides, but um, there's like NOAA data, there's some interesting agricultural materials in there, so it's sort of fun if you're looking for um, like something that's not a novel. The gut docs are an interesting place to start. All right, in terms of the content formats, um, the images are in TIFFs and JPEG 2000. Um, the plain text OCR is generated automatically before the materials are ingested into the library. Um, so the automatically there is the key so that nothing in the digital library is hand keyed or that's not the model. Maybe there are a few things, but the model is not for things to be hand keyed. And it's also not on the whole corrected. So it's uncorrected or dirty OCR. So that means that when you embark on a project, you have to keep in mind how much data remediation you might need to do. Um, and I don't know why this bullet is indented, but there is also bibliographic metadata that's in the form of MARC metadata. And then there's also some special fields. So if MARC metadata is like library catalog metadata. And so if you want to use the metadata to help you hone in on materials or as a piece of your analysis um, using the digital library, it would behoove you to become familiar with MARC. Like you don't need to be a cataloger or a bibliographer. But it just can be helpful to know what fields are available to you, what the limitations are for Mark, because um, you know Mark does have limitations. All right, so there's the digital library piece, and then um, there's the research center side. 
So the research center exists to facilitate text analysis of HathiTrust digital library content. So it's engaged in research and development for tools and data services for text mining using the digital library in particular. So uh, you wouldn't use the tools that the research center develops to mine other kinds of data unless you wanted to do it in conjunction with the materials from the Hathi Trust. So that's really the model that we're looking at here. Um, it's a virtual center in most regards, um, but it's physically located at Indiana University and the University of Illinois. So um, it's a virtual center, but the staff who work on the project are primarily located at those two institutions. Okay, so this is the dumbest workflow for text analysis that you'll see all day. Um, but this is what it looks like, right? If you want to do text analysis, you need text that exists in a digital form. So maybe it's born digital, but in the case of the library, we're talking about text that has been scanned and put through optical character recognition. Your computer is like, it's kind of smart, but actually it's really dumb. And it doesn't know the difference between like a photo of your grandmother and a, f a scan of text. So you have to go through a process like OCR to get the computer to understand that those squiggles on the page are text. So that's what the optical character recognition does, is it makes machine readable text. Okay, so we need the digitized text that um, is machine readable, and then to that text you apply computational methods, word counts, classification, topic modeling, and then the researcher still does his or her analysis. Remember the computers are thinking for us. And the research center comes in at the piece of providing the text data at scale from the digital library, and then also providing tools and services to um, perform those computational methods. Um, and then still the researchers down here um, doing their own thing. One uh, thing to keep in mind is that the research center exists within a paradigm of non-consumptive research. So that sounds like an upper respiratory infection, it's not. Um, the way that the research center describes or defines non-consumptive research um, was outlined in a policy that we published a few years ago, and this text comes directly from that policy. So non-consumptive research is research in which computational analysis is performed on text, but not research in which a researcher reads or displays substantial portions of the text to understand the expressive content presented in it. So uh, you are able to use the digital library resources to understand the ideas within the text, but not to read the way in which the author expressed them. So we're thinking about um, an analysis of um, what was being communicated and maybe thinking about the ways in which it was communicated but not so much like digging in with our own eyes into that actual communication. Um, so this complies with copyright law for a few reasons we feel. Um, one of them has to do with some legal decisions and the idea of the difference between an idea and an expression in US copyright. And it's the foundation of the HTRC's work. So oftentimes people feel frustrated because they want the data, right? You want to have your hands on the data. And you'll see as we go through the workshop today, we're gonna be sort of um, scaling up to the different ways in which you are allowed to deal with the data and how this non-consumptive research paradigm impacts um, the, the way that you are um, handling the text data. Another term that you might hear is non-expressive use. That one's a little gentler, but we, for whatever reason, prefer non-consumptive research. Okay, so the research paradigm, uh, because I know that that was probably clear as mud, includes such computational tasks as text extraction, text analysis, linguistic analysis, automated translation, image analysis, file manipulation, OCR correction, and indexing and search. So those are the kinds of things that the computer can do on behalf of the reader in order to carry out non-consumptive analysis. The HDRC approaches um, text analysis and non-consumptive analysis in three key ways. So the first is using web-based tools via that website that you created an account for that's called HTRC Analytics, where you can find um, pre-built algorithms and a visualization platform called Bookworm. Um, then the second of the approaches is using derived data sets in the form of one called the Extractive Features data set and then also um, through a secure data capsule model for flexible self-directed research. We'll talk about all these in more detail as we go through. 
Okay, then I'll mention that as we do each of our examples in the workshop today, we'll come back again and again to a case study um, that came from a researcher named Sam Franklin um, called Inside the Creativity Boom. And Sam was interested in asking, how do the use and the meaning of the words creative and creativity change over the 20th century? So he had an idea that um, there was a spike in usage, but he wanted to know if there was anything more to dig into there. Was it being used in the same way or had it changed over time? So we'll discuss how this researcher approached his question throughout the workshop as we go forward. And if you wanted to learn more, there's a URL in the slides and you can read a, a report about his project. Um, it's a chapter in his uh, dissertation. Okay, any questions now as we're wrapping up the inter intro? Yeah. Who does the optical character recognition? Um, it depends on the source of the item. So one stream of content goes from the academic library and then materials are shipped to Google. And so Google does some of the OCR and other campuses do it in-house. Yeah. And uh, things are periodically re-OCR. Um, and there's a process by which you can request for things to be re-OCR'd or if things are really mucky, then sometimes they get re-OCR'd. And OCR gets better all the time. So once something is re-OCR'd, then the quality tends to be better. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, so we don't do any of the OCRing ourselves. That's oh, done by the contributing institutions. Okay. Um, and I assume that the ones who are doing it themselves are either using something like Abbey Fine Reader or using Tesseract. Um, and when it happens at Google, they use um, whatever secret Google process that I am not privy to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Just a question about materials that you have. I know you said it was things in the library. Uh -huh. But uh, what about um, audio visual things like television news or uh, United Nations coverage or political speeches and the things that are spoken yeah. uh, in public discourse rather than collected in libraries. Yeah, so there's no AV material that's in there. Um, you can find, like, especially in the government documents, transcripts if they were published um, or speeches if they were published, uh, but that is one um, potential limitation for a researcher like yourself who might be looking for something more contemporaneous. Yeah. Any other questions? Great, okay. So let's talk about collections, work sets, and data sets. Okay, so there's the HathiTrust <laughs> data, and then there's HTRC data, and they are kind of the same thing, and then they're also not the same thing. Okay, so the HathiTrust collection is not static. It grows every day as the members scan and contribute materials to the digital library. Um, so that means that one particular challenge of working with a data source like this is that it's ever-changing. Um, it's also updated, so um, I mentioned the OCR can be redone for improvements. Also, I don't know if anyone, there weren't too many people who said they were familiar with HathiTrust, but occasionally you get these artifacts where it's like somebody's hand was scanned on a page. Um, so when that happens, you can imagine, one, the scan is bad, two, the OCR is bad. And when that happens, people will ask for a page to be rescanned. So that can happen. Um, and then also sometimes the metadata can get updated. Okay, then there's these bibliographic records that are coming in from different contributing libraries, and they rep represent many different cataloging practices. So on the one hand, MARC metadata is very highly structured, and so if you're like me and you're not a library cataloger, you would think, wow, the records must be really consistent. And then no, you realize that some libraries don't use Library of Congress numbers because they use their own cataloging systems, mm -hmm. or they write dates like, we don't know when this was published, it was sometime in the 1900s, so I'm gonna put the date as 19XX, and another institution does 19 question mark question mark, and another place does 19 O and then a dash, and that can make it really hard to dig into the metadata. Okay, uh, HTRC syncs the data nightly from HathiTrust though. So the HathiTrust is growing, 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 and then every night HTRC syncs only the OCR text data, and that exists as a separate copy of the materials at IU. Um, that data is then fed into the HTRC analytics site, so you can run an algorithm or you can use a data capsule, and then um, periodically we do a snapshot of the collection to create the extracted features data set. 
All right, so um, the first place that a lot of researchers start when trying to um, create a set of materials that they want to work with from the digital library is by creating a collection in the HathiTrust digital library. So collections can be made public or they can be made private. Uh, you can search within them, you can share them, you can refer to them in the future, and you can also download the metadata for your collection. So that's HathiTrust collection. And then existing sort of onto the side of that is an HTRC work set. So a work set is a user-created collection of text from the digital library that you're going to use in HTRC services for text analysis. Uh, the work sets themselves can be shared or cited um, because they are um, lists of unique identifiers that are consistent across all of the systems. <coughs> They're suited for non-consumptive text analysis because by default they don't include the text data. So these images are probably a little fuzzy, but here we're seeing a manifest of volume <coughs> IDs. We'll look at IDs more in a little bit. Uh, we're seeing what a HathiTrust collection looks like on the digital library website, and then we're seeing what it looks like as a work set within the research center. So you're seeing in, in these places, there might be links out to the item, and if it's in the public domain, you could read it, but really we're just talking about lists of volume IDs. So work sets are stored in the HTRC analytics site, which as you know, you need a university email address um, to have an account there. Um, and there's a couple different ways that you can build a work set. The first is to create a collection on the HathiTrust site and then import it to the other as a work set. Or if you wanted to do some more programmatic work outside of the um, interface, you can compile lists of volume IDs using other metadata sources or shared lists. When someone is going about building a corpus of text data from the digital library, there's a couple different strategies that they can use. So the first is full text search. So that's one of the benefits of a digital library, is that you can search within the works in a way that you can't do um, in your library catalog here. Um, you can use key term or phrasal searches. And then oftentimes, uh, researchers are, are also or separately using metadata to do their searching and filtering. So looking at things like author, date, or genre. So give me everything that was published in fiction from 1900 to um, 1975 and then maybe you only want the ones that include a, a certain word in the title. But, you know, oftentimes it might be one or the other, sometimes it's in conjunction, um, the two together. The process usually involves some kind of deduplication. So the digital library has a considerable number of duplicates. I don't know how many versions of Pride and Prejudice there are across editions, but there are a lot. So as a researcher, you have to decide which one is the most valuable to me for my analysis. Is it the first edition? Is it the one with the best OCR? Is it the one that doesn't have a forward or an afterward because that's extra data processing that I'm gonna have to do? So every researcher makes that decision for him or herself. Um, and so, yeah, 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 we did all that. Okay, so you guys are going to do a quick hands-on activity to first build a collection in the digital library and then move it over to the uh, research center site uh, just to get the hang of how that process can happen. So on the second page of your handout, there are instructions for this. Um, I can't remember if the handout I gave you has specific search terms. You can choose to use those, although uh, our examples for the rest of the day might go off the rails from what those search terms are, but, so don't feel constrained by those. Search for whatever you want. Follow the example if you want, but also search for whatever you want. And I'll be demoing up here, but you can also follow the instructions and go through it on your own. So the first thing that you want to do, doesn't make my bar any bigger, is go to hathitrust.org. You might have been logged out at this point, so make sure that you're logged in. Go through two-factor. Do you guys do two-factor authentication? Yeah. Okay, and then um, you'll see that you have the option to search 
full text or catalog, make sure you're in the full text search. There's some like programming <coughs> decision that was made where you can't build collections from the catalog search. So use the full text search. Should you what? Uh, which edition should we add? Which edition should we select that? Oh, sorry, I can't. Which one should we select? Whichever one you want. Yeah. So select a few things yeah. and then you can create your collection. I don't know what these are, but I'm just sort of going to click a few. So once you've selected a few items, <coughs> then you can create a collection from your selection. So there's a drop down that says select collection, and you can choose to create a new collection, and then you would hit add selected. You name it. And then you have the option to make it private or public. So if you were working on something and you felt like you really didn't want this to be public, you can choose private, but it makes the import option different for going to the analytics site. So I'm going to choose to do public because it fits our workflow today. So save changes. And then I click my collections and I should see my example there. Is there a limit on the size of the collection? No. <coughs> um, there must be an upper limit somewhere, but they create um, collections um, programmatically for some different projects. And so like the federal government's documents exist as a collection, and that has close to a million volumes. Um, if you are interested in looking at more than a certain number of items, then this process of searching and selecting um, could feel onerous, and we'll talk about other options. Yeah. Okay, so how's that going? So now I'm going to go to analytics, I'm going to sign in. Okay, so once I'm in the analytics site, I do create a work set. And here you see you have the option to upload a file or to import from HathiTrust. So you use upload a file if you had made a private collection and you didn't want to make it public. You have a way here from your collection to download the metadata. You can upload that metadata file directly. Or say you... <coughs> found out that someone you know had done some interesting work and they sent you a list of volume IDs and you wanted to make a work set without having to rebuild it in the digital library, you can upload that list, that file, directly to the site. But I'm going to import from HathiTrust. I just grabbed the URL from my collection. So I was here. Give it a second to load. When I was looking at my collections, and then I clicked on the name. I named mine UC Test Example. And then from that page where I'm looking at the items that I had selected, I click <coughs> in the URL bar, I do Command C, and then I go back to HTRC Analytics and put the URL in. And I have to give it a name. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm going to do this the correct way. I hit Fetch Collection and it will pull over the name automatically that I had used before. I don't have to use that same name but I can. And then I enter a description. I don't think the description is required. Ah, yes, right, because that's grayed out. 
That's a new thing. And then you have the option to make your work set public or private, which is different than making your collection public or private. So the work sets can be public or private within the analytics site, which means that if it's, um, if you change it in one place or the other from public to private, they don't communicate. The systems aren't that connected, but you can make it so that um, other users can't find your work set on this site. If it's a private work set, only you'll see it in your list. If it's a public work set, then um, anyone who logs <coughs> in has the option to, to use it. Then I'll click create work set. No. Okay. Is it okay with calling Eleanor? Eleanor, please. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Eleanor, how do you use the the guide prefers to like selecting the whole collection, but I was only able to unless I was looking at it wrong, select one page. Is there any way to get all the documents that the search return? Was no. There's not a way to do that. Okay. Uh, we'll talk about other ways to grab more than, like, if you wanted to get everything. We'll talk about ways you can do that outside of the system. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you make it public? <laughs> yeah, and if you don't want to do that, then you can download the metadata and upload that file. Yeah. Is anyone else so stuck? <laughs> Did you make it public? Oh. <coughs> yeah, or else you can download the metadata and upload the file. Yeah. Are you logged in? You might have logged it out automatically. Okay. See how that goes. Anyone else stuck? Did you make it public? Yep. Oh, interesting. Can you go back to that? Make both of these say this exact phrase. Make both of these I've never seen. It. What does the error say again? What browser are you using? Or just try downloading yeah, the metadata and uploading the file. I don't know. I've never seen that error before. It might be a browser based error. I use the search page, but I've never used the browser based error. Oh, okay. I don't know if that's it. Okay. <laughs> okay, how's it going? I'll give you a few more minutes. Okay. That's so funny. Does anyone else, does anyone need me to repeat a step? Yeah. Okay, I'll go back to slides. I haven't done that recently, but let's look. You know, I don't know that there is. That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Skip ahead in time. And then open the analytics website. Download that file. That's the only file site that will accept if you like upload that. Like to create a work set. Okay, we'll give folks a few minutes. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Is that creating, when you create a work set from an upload, uh -huh. is that metadata file downloaded from the library side the only file it accepts? No, you could give it a, I think it's a TXT, TSV, or CSV. Okay. As long as there's a header row, 
Like if it doesn't have a header row, then it skips the first row. So you, okay. if you want all your volumes, <coughs> have a header row. And I think you're supposed to have the word ID in the first row. And it needs to be in the first column. Okay. So as long as you have volume IDs in the first column, then it will take that. Okay, like yes. the unique IDs from hot teachers. Yes, yeah. Okay. 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 Yes, yeah. Can we do a like that? No. Yeah. So this this site is meant for analyzing the digital library volumes. <coughs> so th there's not a model in place for uploading other data, except towards the end where we're going to talk about how you could look at other data in combination with the digital library data. Is anybody else still majorly stuck? I know there's a couple of you. OK, so what we're going to do is, in the interest of time, we're going to um, talk about the APIs. Those of you that are still building collections, keep working on that piece. And if you catch up for the last part of the activity, that's great, but focus on the collection building piece while we go through this stuff, okay? All right, so um, both the Hopi Trust and the HTRC maintain APIs for getting access to uh, different data. So the Hopi Trust APIs are a bibliographic API and a data API. And then there's also other data sources that I'll talk about in a second. So the bibliographic API for um, HathiTrust allows you to pull information about the volumes in the form of that metadata record, um, generally using some kind of unique identifier. And we're going to do an activity looking at the Bib API together. There's also a data API. And the data API is um, has a, a handful of limitations that make it not great for most people who are hoping to do text analysis. So it's the public domain data, so that's like one obvious limitation of it. Um, and then there are some rules in place about who digitized the thing, and there's just in like a rate limit, so I think you can only do like 10 volumes at a time. So it's really not meant for getting access to um, large data sets, but it does exist if you wanted to download a volume or two from the digital library. Then the Hathi Trust also makes available other data sources, um, including the Hathi files, which are a monthly updated uh, TSV file with metadata for every volume in the digital library. So it has right now 16.9 million rows, so it's a big fat file, uh, but you can load it into something like a uh, SQLite database locally, and then you can start to do some of your own searching and querying that way. So for researchers who are looking at that collection builder page and they're like, no, like, no, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna make a collection this way, the Hathi files are the next, a next good step for starting to build a collection. Um, the HTRC has its own data API, um, but the caveat is that it's only available in a data capsule. And data capsule doesn't mean anything to you yet, but we're going to talk about it more later. Um, but you can't use it outside the data capsule. There's also the extracted features rsync that we'll talk about more, and then the option to run an algorithm against a work set. Okay, so let's look at the HathiTrust data API. So you, yeah. Well, did I already tell you all this? Download public domain volumes, non-Google digitize. You get the page images and the OCR, which is one difference from dealing with HTRC, is you have access to the page images, because remember, we don't sync that. We only sync the OCR. Um, and you only do one volume at a time, and then you're rate limited, so it's not great for large-scale access. OK, then there's the HathiTrust Bibliographic API, which provides programmatic access to bibliographic metadata for volumes in HathiTrust. So the metadata can be retrieved using a specially formatted URL, it's an API, um, and the, um, some kind of identifier. We're going to do an example using a volume ID just to get the hang of looking for volume IDs. 
So there's a URL here if you want more information, if you wanted to track it down later. Um, but we're going to just try pulling up one metadata record, because obviously if you wanted more, you'd need to script this, um, to see if we can pull up the full metadata record for it. Um, so this is on page five of your handout. So the first important thing to get the hang of is that we are using an HTID, a volume ID. You can pull up the metadata records using other identifiers, but in this case, we're using the HTID. It starts with th um, three, sometimes two, sometimes more, um, alphanumeric characters, and then a period. And then in the URL bar, it goes all the way to a semicolon. The um, alphanumeric code at the beginning of the identifier is the digit, it's the um, originating institution. So maybe they didn't digitize it, maybe Google digitized it, but um, this is where it comes from. So MDP is um, Michigan, HVD is Harvard, uh, UC1 is the University of California. That's generally not super important to people, but that does give you an idea of how it's structured. Okay, so I'm gonna grab a, um, I'm gonna actually, cause I don't have the handout handy. So this is what the um, API call looks like. So let me copy and paste, I'm gonna cheat. Okay, so let me grab the volume ID for one of my records. These IDs are in the Hathi files. So um, if you were using, say, the Hathi files to build a collection, then you would grab the Hathi file, the ID from there, and then you could also then turn around and grab the um, full metadata if you wanted. Okay, so no, we don't want to be on the record. Maybe we want to look at the item. So let's just look at one of my items. Okay, so now once I'm looking at one of my items, I want to grab after the equal sign up through the end of the number. So I'm getting MDP dot yada yada yada, and I'm going to copy it. And then I want to put it into the structured URL. So I need to go grab it from the catalog. So catalog.hatitrust.org. And then I'm using the API. And then I want to pull the metadata for volumes. And then I have the option of saying whether I want uh, full or I can't remember what the other one is. It's limited or reduced. It says brief. There we go. So uh, the brief record gives you a smaller mark record, but I want the full one. And then I'm using, remember, HTID, but I could use an OCLC number. How many of you are familiar with an OCLC number? Okay, OCLC is like the granddaddy of library cataloging aggregation. And so some researchers find OCLC pathways to uh, materials as one way to build a uh, list of volume IDs. So let's say you got some OCLC numbers then you could, through this process, backwards grab the um, HTID numbers. So there's sort of like these different ways that you can get at this stuff. But in this example, we're using HTID, and then I'm gonna put it at the end, the one that I just got, and then the, I also need to type in dot J-S-O-N. And here, uh, Firefox tries to be helpful, and it will structure the results for me. So I could, of course, not just look at this in the browser. If I had scripted it, I could set it up to download as a file to my machine. But what I'm looking at is MARC metadata in JSON format. So the MARC has been like into JSON. Um, so if you're familiar here, you're seeing there's subfields and codes. So this is where learning how to parse this metadata can be particularly helpful. Not every project that uses the digital library needs to like really get their boots muddy with um, the MARC metadata, but it's just something to keep in mind that that might be a factor that you um, need to explore more. And then I'm also looking at, because this was, I'll show you one thing. I'm looking at just one item. 
but it's pulling up the metadata record for every one of these things that are linked from one record. So if you're familiar with library cataloging, um, you'll have, if you have multiple items, they can all be linked to one record in the, in our, in the database. And so all of these things live on one cataloging record. So you'll see down below, beep, beep. I'm getting to see, here's one from University of Michigan, here's another one, here's another one. So they're all linked off of one record. So I'm pulling the cataloging record for all of those things. Okay, are there any questions about that or that process? If that had been a public domain, uh, like a volume, would it have pulled in the text as well? No, it will just pull in the bibliographic data, yeah. If you want to grab the text, then you can use the um, data API. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay, so this is probably the most confusing part about HTRC and the digital library, is like, where, what, which way and what path do I follow? Okay, so here's a handy chart. So you have, remember, a few options for getting access to data. So, I feel like this is in a really weird format. No, it's in a great format, but we're gonna start here. So we talked about the HathiTrust Data API. From the HT Data API, you can get access to full text OCR and page images um, that you can download onto your own machine, only in the public domain, and only if they weren't digitized by Google. Okay, so maybe that meets your use case, but maybe it doesn't. Okay, so then if it doesn't, then the next option is to do a custom data set request. Um, that gives you access to full text OCR, not the page images. Even though it says download page images, I don't think that it includes them, so that's a mistake. Uh, public domain, and then there are some restrictions depending on your university. So some universities have signed an additional agreement with Google. Um, Cincinnati hasn't signed it. The list is like, I don't know, maybe 25 to 30 long. So it's not every one of the 140. Um, but if you felt like um, you thought that people on your campus were going to want to be making these custom data requests, then as long as the university has signed the agreement, then anyone on campus can submit a request and get access to the Google Digitized Text. So it can benefit a number of scholars on your campus. So then you might be saying, I want more than just the public domain data. What are my options? The next is to think about HTRC extractive features. We're going to be playing with those after the break. And these are abstracted text and metadata from the volumes in the digital library. It's all right statuses, no restrictions. So you can download it onto your computer, and that's a massive data set for you to play with. Then there's the HTRC data API. Remember, this is in a capsule only. And it's the full text OCR, but then there's um, some rights restrictions that have to do with the kind of capsule that you set up that we'll dig into more later. So um, there will not be a test on this. You don't need to memorize the chart now, but this is a handy thing to come back to and try to work yourself through the flow chart of what's available to you in different forms. Okay, so let's take a quick look at Sam and then we'll take, uh, we'll take a five minute break. Okay, so remember Sam's looking at creative and creativity. So the first thing that Sam did was he searched across the full text of the digital library uh, for all volumes containing um, a version of creative. So with the asterisk at the end. And this created an, an initial list of over a million volumes. Um, and then from that initial list, he did some deduplication. So Sam decided for his project that he would keep different editions of the same work but discard multiple copies of the same edition. So using Pride and Prejudice as an example again, even though that likely wasn't in his uh, data set, um, if it were published in, um, he was only looking at the 20th century, 1915 and 1930, and so that's two, two different editions of the same work. He kept each of those because he thought that it showed some cultural significance, but if there was two copies of the 1915, he got rid of uh, one of them. And then he ended up with a refined list of volumes for his analysis. So he went through this process to make that decision about deduplication on his own. And that search that he did, uh, we helped him out with that if anyone's curious. And we'll talk about um, options for getting additional help um, later on. Okay, so let's take a five minute break and we'll start again at 1025. Is there anyone who uh, would benefit from eyes on their machine during the break? 
Anyone still stuck with logging in or? Okay. I didn't even go to something that somebody brought me out of the It might be something weird with the um, benefits fair. Some of the Library of Congress. Like the art can get sort of like I remember somebody having an error before. You might try going back and see if you can do it to get the record. So use that ID and then in your call instead of HTID, I think you do record ID. It's either record or record ID and see if that works. Yeah, of course. And then Dr. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, there must be something else. Let me look at that. Okay. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so tables are a tricky thing. So the OCR can be really funky. So if you have a specific project example in mind with a table, you might want to try to dig in and see what the OCR looks like first. Um, there is an interesting project called the University of California Clio Metrics. Okay, so look that up. It's like C L E O. And that researcher um, extracted tables from Hotchkiss audience and then did this project to look at where undergraduates at the University of California were coming from within the state of California and like did some analysis about whether they were urban or um, like living out in the country and maybe some try to compare it to like with a socioeconomic status. And he had a workflow in yeah, place. Yeah, actually. But you might be able to get to more. Yeah, that's the best I can say. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay. That gives you some more to start. Yes, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Have you heard back from anyone? Okay. Okay. I'll harass people on Slack. Okay. Wonderful. And then from the URL bar, the item, grab the ID from there. 
Yes, yeah. So this is like the least technical way to do it, but it's the way to do it. Oh, 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 so search for an item. So volume being like a, uh, an item. So a book, basically. Oh, you're following a lot of Yeah. Yeah, so volume is just like um, a, uh, I don't know what the word I want is, but it's just our way of saying search for something. Yes, yeah. Or it looks like it's underlining things. Like, and it makes me think it's really important. Yeah, so search for anything you want, and then once you're looking at it, that's really important. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it's like, it's like, it's Okay, let's slowly start to come back together. I know we're still waiting on a couple people, and that was a pretty short break. Okay, so we're going to move now to talking about the uh, more fun part, so analyzing the data. So we're going to focus in particular on the extracted features data set, which I'll describe in more detail. But first, let me say two things about the algorithms. Um, so HTRC maintains a suite of off-the-shelf web-based algorithms for text analysis. So they're particularly good for teaching um, or for getting your feet wet or for the kind of person who's like, yeah, I want to start exploring this wide world of text analysis, but no, I'm not willing to learn how to program. Um, so they're for analyzing HathiTrust data only. Uh, you run it against a work set, meaning you pick which work set you want and which algorithm you want to run. Um, and then you marry the two together and you get your results. Um, the kinds of analysis that you can do using these algorithms are, um, there's a, the, the suite is like five, six, I should know that, but yeah, it's like a handful. Um, so there's a token and word count and word cloud algorithms, so it's just like a quick and dirty way of getting the feel for your um, work set. You can use a topic modeling algorithm, if you're familiar with topic modeling, to explore some of the themes and topics that might be in your work set. Or you can do named entity extraction. So if you wanted to do NER um, and you didn't want to have to like write any code on your own, you could pretty quickly just grab out the named entities from your collection. Um, so that's the example that you see on the screen. So you're seeing the volume ID, the page that the entity occurred on, what the entity actually is, and then the type. So it's not quite as full as some um, NER outputs, so it doesn't tell you like the specific character location of the um, word. I know sometimes in the outputs you'll see like where in the line it occurred, uh, but this can give you a good feel um, uh, for what the entities are in your text. And um, the NER algorithm uses the Stanford OpenNLP um, NER tool, and so if you were going to run this Stanford tool on your own, maybe you would want to use it in the site so that you didn't have to do any programming on your own. Again, you access these from HTRC Analytics, um, and so uh, you would log in and then you would pick a work set and do your analysis, and you'll have a chance to play with these later if you so choose. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, where are those computations being done? Ah, uh, yes. So these computations are being done <coughs> at um, Indiana University. Um, so sometimes there is a slight delay because um, while I think that we are a very important and a special research center, our projects are like minuscule compared to the other things that happen on the cluster at IU. Like there's people doing really big projects. And so we have to wait for um, a space in the queue 
And so we have to wait till there's a uh, wall time for us to go. And so sometimes you'll see that it's queuing and waiting, and that's because you're waiting to get in the line. And often our, our jobs finish really quickly once you're going. Um, so if you're running one of these algorithms, you'll see like it's submitted, it's queued, it's processing, it's done. That process like, really shouldn't take more than like 30 minutes is an upper limit for being in the queue. So be patient, but then also if you have, like if you're waiting more than 30 minutes, you should send us an email because maybe something went wrong with your job. Yeah, does that help answer the question? Okay, any other questions? Okay, here's another text analysis workflow. Okay, so um, another way we can think about the research process is that we're moving from raw text through text preparation, and then oftentimes researchers move into this phase of translating um, their text data into features before that's ready to go into algorithmic use. And so this is where we are now in this features bit. So as I've mentioned, um, the HTRC has a data set called the Extracted Features data set. Um, it's a downloadable uh, data set that uh, represents 15.7 million volumes. For some reason, I think it's more like just over 16, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, but it, it's a snapshot of the digital library. So we periodically re-crunch data, but we're not doing it every day as the library grows. Um, it's structured data in JSON format. And it consists of both information about the volume and about every page in the volume. So the features are selected data and metadata elements that are pulled out, extracted from that raw text. And we hope that they position the researcher to begin his or her analysis. So most researchers, not most, but many researchers will go down the same path workflow where you first have your unstructured text, and then your next step might be to tokenize your text. Maybe it's to do counts. Maybe it's to do part of speech tagging. And so uh, we do some of that pre-processing of the data for you. Um, the beauty of that is that process of pre-processing also moves us far enough away from the expressive format that we can release the data set for every volume in the digital library, or at least of the snapshot. So there's no restrictions based on rights access. So some of the per volume features that you'll find are, um, so these are primarily pulled from the bibliographic metadata, so it includes things like the title, Zoonomia, or the laws of organic life. Um, you'll see that there's imprint information, which is often uh, correlates with the author. You'll see that there's a language tag, where is the language? Maybe that's not in my screenshot. There's a volume level um, language tag that comes from um, what the library cataloger, what language they said the work was in. And then you'll see this suite of identifiers. So we're trying to make it possible for you to like slice and dice in different ways into the collection. OCLC number, which I mentioned before, and then also the HathiTrust ID number. Then, um, how many of you are familiar with JSON? How many of you are familiar with XML? Okay, so if you can read XML, you can read JSON, it's just less verbose. Okay, so look how nicely structured this is. Um, we're getting some information about what the feature is, and then we get the information about, about uh, we get the actual feature. So uh, we get the page sequence. So this isn't the um, page number that would appear at the bottom of the page, but it's the scan number. So. Um, you know, they, maybe they scan the front page, maybe they um, scanned like a blank page at the beginning. That would get a sequence number. Um, so, but those are analogous with the sequence numbers for the scans from HathiTrust. And then you also get some computationally inferred metadata. So you get things like how many words occur on the page, how many lines are there, how many of those lines are empty, how many sentences are there, and then you get a computationally inferred language tag. So um, there are some instances where um, you know, a work might have in a catalog, they say it's in Spanish, there are some pages in French, this will help you determine what the language is on each of the pages. Okay, so then within each page, remember we're drilling down through our JSON, then we have per page section features. Okay, so let's imagine our, our page here from the actual work. We have a header, we have a body, and then this one doesn't have a footer, but we could imagine that it's down there. 
And then we have another page, and we have characters that start lines, and we have characters that end lines. That information is all reflected uh, for each page section in the, vo in the volume for every page. So every page section of every page and every volume. So you'll see in the body of whatever page this is, I cut it off so we can't see the sequence number, we see that there are 504 tokens, 43 lines, none of them are empty, 12 sentences, and then we have this beautiful thing called token POS count. POS does not stand for what you're thinking of. It stands for a part of speech. So we're seeing every one of the tokens tagged by part of speech and the number of times that they occur. So if you need to do a um, bag of words analysis or some kind of machine learning project where it doesn't matter to you the original order of the text, this data set is really helpful as a jumping off point. The codes here come from the pen tree bank. Is anyone familiar with the pen tree bank? Okay, so uh, we didn't make up these codes. Um, this is from a standard um, coding um, structure for parts of speech. So NNP is proper noun. JJ, anyone want to venture a guess? Adjective. Adjective, yeah. Uh, NN is a noun, and then IN is preposition. So then you can start to do things like say, okay, I want to get at the tokens in the text, and I either only want to look at adjectives and nouns, and I don't think the prepositions are important to my analysis, or I want to make sure that um, I am able to distinguish in my analysis the different kinds of the word rows, because maybe it's a person and maybe it is, um, in another case, a verb. Did you have a question? Yeah, completely random and tiny. Yeah. But I noticed that it uh, renders old school S's as their own glyphs. Uh -huh. Is there an automatic translation? Or if you, for example, search for synthesis on old text, do you have to be sure that you're using synthesis with a modern S and synthesis with old school glyph? That's a great question. So this work in particular is including that OCR era where we're seeing that the F, the long S issue. And so here, you would probably want to do some remediation. How it would end up in a search of the digital library, I don't think it's doing any of that correction for you. But that is something to keep in mind, yeah. Do you have a question? Uh, does that classify every word in the document? Yes, yeah. For suppose, uh, in some cases, a word can be classified as two different persons based on the sentence. So yes. That yeah, so it's by the page. So let's say going back to our rows and rows example, even if rows appeared on one page <coughs> three times, one is a person's name, like rows, rows yeah. with the rows, then there would be one for rows as a proper noun, one for it as a noun, and one for it as, an ad as a verb. So the, we would have the word appearing and then the um, counts would reflect the part of speech. Does that make sense? So the machine can interpret it? Yes, yeah. This is all machine interpreted, yeah. yeah. Uh, usually in the pre-processing part, like we remove all the very high frequency words, uh -huh. like ease and uh, so does it also do that? Or? No, it doesn't. And part of the reason it doesn't is because um, there are different stop word lists that people like to use. Are people familiar with stop words? Okay, so stop words are frequently occurring words that oftentimes researchers pull out for certain kinds of analysis because you know, it might not be important to you to know that the is the most frequently occurring uh, word. Uh, but for some kinds of work like authorial analysis, it turns out that how you use words like the is really indicative of your writing style and that's what makes you different from someone else, it's not the different words. And then also there's a school of thought, someone in the room might know more about this than I do, who's act, who, they're actually saying that stop words are not as useful, but what you should be doing is getting rid of the words that occur most frequently within your specific data set. So that's like a new, I don't know how like new it is, but that's like one train of thought that's gaining momentum. Yeah. So we leave that up to the researcher. So we've tried to do remediation, but also do as little harm as possible to what people might want to do from the data. And these are the counts just on that scanned page? Just on that page, yeah. Is there anywhere where it counts in that document? Well, you would add them up. Okay. Yeah. And we'll look at an example to do that together. Okay, so you can do anything that requires, are you familiar with the phrase bag of words? Okay, so anything where you need a bag of words, basically you don't care about word order. 
So topic modeling, Dunning's log likelihood, certain kinds of machine classification. All right, so we're going to do an example for the next little bit using the HTRC feature reader Python library. So um, in conjunction with releasing this data set, one of our developers who has since moved on to a faculty position at the University of Denver developed a Python library for working with the extracted features files. Um, so it facilitates research using those JSON files. Um, you install it using a package manager like pip. The source code lives on GitHub. This is my favorite question I've ever gotten in a workshop. It's like where, like, where does it live? I guess it lives on GitHub. Okay, so that's where you go to get it. Um, but you would install it using a package manager. And you also have to have pandas installed to run it. And pandas is a Python library for um, data science. Okay, so now we have the fun bit where things could like go really well or they could go really off the rails. So we are going to try using a platform called Binder to look together at a Jupyter notebook with some code that we're going to play around with. So have any of you worked with a Jupyter notebook before? OK, how many of you have done Python programming before? OK, so uh, that's great. Jupyter notebooks are a handy way of rendering your code so that um, you can have both the code blocks and then also like narrative around it. And so it's good for tutorials um, and structuring um, and sharing your code in that way. Um, and the sample extracted features files we're going to be using in the activity are preloaded for you in the data folder. And the code is pre-written, but we'll be making modifications. Okay, so uh, you can go to this link, or there's a, the link is also in your handout. And let's see how it goes. <coughs> Has anyone ever used Binder? Okay. You're thinking so hard. Echo the clock. Okay, so we want to notice I said there's, remember, there's the data folder and there's the extracted features files preloaded for you. So there's a little bit of tour guide. And then you want to click on the file that ends in um, .ipynb, the notebook file. Okay, so we, we can go through this together, or you can go through it faster than we go through it as a group. Um, and then there's also all of this contextual information. Oh, someone should have told me you can't see. Hello. <laughs> I used to teach an online class, and one time the group I was teaching let me go like, I don't know, it was a three hour class that I taught at five in the morning for a group in Hong Kong. And they let me talk for 45 minutes without telling me I hadn't advanced from the first slide. It's like, hello. <laughs> you know we're all tired. Okay, so it was, it was their bedtime too, like on a Friday night. All right, so here's our notebook. Let me show you again really quickly that within the um, structure here we have the data here that we could, you could look at also. They're zipped up uh, .bz2, so they're not pretty if you try to open them. Okay, and then I'll also just give you the, um, a little plug at the beginning that the code and instructions that are used in this notebook are mashing together code and examples that come from a programming historian lesson that if you wanted to get more experience with the extracted features files or with pandas, it's really great for walking you through this and many more examples. And then also there was a module developed for the Berkeley Data Science Institute um, that's called library-htrc, and they have a few more examples in that one than, than we are using. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do to get up and running is to import the Python modules we'll use through this notebook. So we need to import the um, feature reader. We need to import matplotlib because we're going to do some plotting. We need NumPy for some examples, and then this is key for making feature reader work. We also need pandas. So you'll want to make sure that you execute each of the cells. When I tried to go through this by myself last night again, um, I ran into some issues where I couldn't um, use the key shortcuts to run the cell. Some of you might have better luck, but um, I think it's shift return or control return. return. Shift, shift. 
Yeah, shift enter. For some reason for me it was doing something weird. So you can try that. If it doesn't work, just hit run. Okay, so as I mentioned, the extracted features files are formatted in JSON. Um, and they come when you download them zipped up to try to save some space for you. So they're compressed. So they download as .json.bz2. So you can unzip them using the best thing ever called bunzip2, but you don't have to to use the feature reader library. Uh, the feature reader library is able to interact with the files in their zipped up format, which is pretty handy if you have a large data set. Okay. Um, so within the feature reader library, there's something called the feature reader object. There's a volume object and there's a page object. So the feature reader objects like preps are um, data that we want to analyze. And then every one of those files is rendered as a volume object. And then um, if you want to drill down to those pages, then you use the page object. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to set up are um, files that are preloaded in the data folder for you um, as a feature reader object. So run that one if you haven't already. Okay, and then see if we let's see if we can print all the titles. Okay, so this is not an error. It's just that our data set happens to all be serials. So they have the same title. So they're all public papers of the presidents of the United States. Okay, so we know that they're there. All our files are there. Um, if you wanted to go through all the examples in the notebook and then change the code to go back through and look at the data that's in the 1930s folder, you can. Um, but you don't have to do that. You see it's commented out in this section here. Okay, so then let's look and see what our first volume is. So remember the feature reader object is everything that's in our directory or everything that we fed in to be the, within the feature reader. And then the volume helps us hone in on each one of those individual volumes. So now we're seeing that the first of our volumes in our set is public papers of, the United, of uh, presidents of the United States we see that these are all of the potential authors. So again, this gets to some of the um, <coughs> openness about serials metadata because um, our volume in particular wasn't written by all of these people or authored by them. And then we see we have the volume ID here. Um, we do have a date though, so 1976. Does anyone have any ideas about which one of these potential presidents these public papers could relate to in 1976? Is he on the list? I think it's Carter. Am I wrong? I wasn't alive in 1976. Ford? Ford would have been president in 76. Perfect. Okay, so this is Gerald Ford. So the volumes that we have here, this public papers of the presidents of the United States, in the 1970 directory is every one of these volumes that's published by the federal government of, um, it's like transcriptions of speeches and maybe some like public addresses that they did um, for the decade of 1970. And then we also have the decade of 1930 loaded up for you if you wanted to play around. Okay, so we can also get the URL. So uh, command click, don't just click you can command click to open in the digital library if you wanted to look at it. Oh look, Ford, yes, it's 1976, okay. Uh, if it were not in the public domain, then you would get taken to a page that let <coughs> you search within the volume here from the digital library. But again, the extracted features files are for everything in the digital library, um, up through a, a snapshot from uh, 2016. Okay, so I'll point out just one other thing here is um, there's a few different metadata elements that are available to you. So it was preloaded with author, and you'll see here we're getting, um, this is actually from the imprint, but we're seeing all of these authors, but we know that this one relates to Ford. But there are other metadata elements that you could pull. So uh, backspace and get rid of author 
until you have just the period and the parentheses, and then hit tab. And then you'll get a list. So choose another one of these metadata elements that you want to um, want to grab. And I think all of these will work. I haven't experimented with all of them. I'm going to do classification. So you'll see, I pulled up the Library of Congress and the Dewey Decimal classification for this volume. Um, so you'll see that within these files, there's quite a bit of um, metadata that can help you do some um, work around figuring out information about the volume. So some people do work where they will say, I'm only interested in a particular Library of Congress classification area. And so you could just like, these three digits are important for figuring out what the classification is and you could use that to hone in on materials. Okay, so the other thing that we can do is um, we can grab very quickly the tokens per page. So this is the uh, number of tokens or words that appeared on each one of these pages. So on page one, nine, two, there's <coughs> none. Page five, there's 48. So we're using this bit here from the feature reader, tokens per page without having to write any special code ourselves to go through and um, grab those numbers, right? We didn't have to say for every page in volume, <coughs> uh, count tokens and make a table, right? This um, here, tokens per page is doing that for us. That's what's built into the feature reader that help parsing through the files. Okay. So then let's visualize them. So here we're seeing what it looks like, the, the words per page visualized. So what are you seeing here? Probably like a table of contents and then some other non-content pages until you get to the actual document. Yeah, so we're seeing pages where there is little to no text, so few tokens, and then we're seeing pages with more tokens, so probably the meat of this volume. Can anyone think of how this could be useful in terms of um, starting a text analysis project? You could start when the words start being more dense. Yeah, so if you wanted to take sort of like a um, not super pre precise, but sort of like machete <laughs> approach to <laughs> narrowing in, you could say I only want to um, I only want to grab the pages within the JSON file once we hit a certain threshold of tokens without having to go through and hand identify. I would also look at what those big counts are. Yeah, that's Why a good question. So uh huh. I haven't dug into this volume enough to know. Is that a counting error? Is that an issue with the file? Or are there really some you know pages that have an absurd number of words? Okay, so this right here is a pandas data frame. How many of you are familiar with a pandas data frame? Okay, so pandas is a Python library for doing data science, and it's really handy because it allows you to uh, work with structured data. So remember the JSON files are structured. So we can load it in, and then we can render it in this sort of tabular format. And pandas, inbuilt into pandas is nice ways for traversing across the data. So we can narrow in on um, certain pages, we can narrow in on certain elements of the file, like um, part of speech, we'll look at an example for that later. Um, but because first we have the structure of JSON and then we're working with it in pandas, we very quickly go from a zipped up JSON file to this pandas data frame with the tokens per page. Okay, so why don't you try to do the next few examples? So, here's a, we're grabbing again, an, um, another data frame that we can load showing um, more information than just this first one which was just the page and the count, that's tokens per page. But here if we call token list, then we can see the page 
the section, the token, the part of speech, and the count. So you can play around with um, the numbers here. So we're doing from um, the 1,000th to the 1,100th row, skipping by 15. But you could explore there to try looking at um, pages 1 through 5. And I'll take away the skip. And that should work. Yep, so. Shouldn't go, oh. Yeah, what did I do wrong here? Oh, oh, we're looking at the specific words and not the pages. That's what it is. Okay. Does that make sense? So we're getting words one through seven, all on page one. Does that make sense? I was misreading it, thinking we were looking at the pages. Okay, but you can play around <coughs> here. Okay, and then see if you can hone in to the file to grab only pages where a particular word occurs. So in the example I had nuclear, you can run it with nuclear, but try replacing between these quotes here another word. So see how you can narrow in on just that word as it occurs. You ran opportunity? Uh, we're doing a thing on management opportunities so oh. that we put for that word. I thought, well, that seems like. Yeah. <laughs> and then, what? Okay. Uh, I'm going to do oil. So, did you Okay, so now I can grab only the pages where oil occurs, the word oil. I can see the part of speech and the number of times they occur on each one of these particular pages. So keep that in mind when we come back to Sam in a little bit. I have a quick question. Yeah. For right now you have like section set to all. It looks like they're predominantly body, but whatever. Um, where does the documentation live to show you how to set up that, or like what the vocabulary is? For? For things like section equals all, like, or if I want to set it to body, like to know what term to use those things. Yes, so. Yeah, so on GitHub, <coughs> there's the Future Reader Library. Okay. And there's more examples here that you can explore if you want to. And then there is also um, a page about usage that has more information. Okay. And I always find the structure of GitHub to be yeah, sort of perplexing. But there is. Yeah, okay, so there is also this, there is a, if you hit read the docs, then yeah. there's also this page here that has um, more information about the library. Okay, cool. Okay, so what kind of words did you look for? Can you run? Uh, you did run? Yeah. Oop, oop, oop. I always want to hit enter and that does not work. Okay. Is it, uh, it is classified as known at some What is VB and password? What button Oh, let's look it up. Well, it said that she pulled up briefly. basically that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, it's a verb in the past participle. So I think that that is. There's like to run and uh, like to run versus we run. Yeah, so you could decide as you did your work that you wanted to condense those or you could keep them separate. But in this case, it is distinguishing between those two. Yeah, go ahead. What if you wanted to find if two, word, two words uh, appear together in the same page? So like, let's just say um, combination, like, yeah, like a combination. So like urban crime or like uh, poverty? Right. Yes. Yeah. So um, 
I can't think of off the top of my head how you would code that, but you would look for pages that meet that criteria. criteria. So you would have to do some kind of and here where you're saying grab me pages where you see run and you see. Yeah. Okay, did anyone else try another word that they want to, sh that was interesting? No? Okay, so then we can also um, subset the data by, um, like we can further subset it. So we can pull out specific rows. So let's say you're interested in words that only occur more than a certain number of times. You want to get rid of the frequently occurring words. So in here we're setting the limit to 100. <coughs> so we're saying give me a word count and um, I don't care about the part of speech so I turned off the part of speech and I don't care what page it occurred on so turn that off. But I'm knowing that in the body there is the token personal and it occurs 102 times. So then you can further do that kind of filtering. So you could say, I, um, you could also do it the other way, right? So you could set a, a high threshold and say, I want words that occur fewer than this many times. Um, or maybe you figure out how to do some ratio where you say there are, I don't know, what's a reasonable number of words in a volume? 600,000 words in this volume. And I want the word, you know, there's a way, you, know, like you could figure out how to subset so you're getting rid of the most frequently occurring words. This one, we're getting rid of the words that occur, um, we only want the ones that occur more than 100 times. Does that make sense? So the least frequently occurring words we're filtering out. So now, using the pandas data frame, we're narrowing in on specific rows. So we're no longer just looking at, see in this one, we're getting every instance of run. And in this one, we've narrowed down so that we're filtering on the rows to get only those ones that are occurring more than 100 times. Okay, and remember we're only right now looking at one volume. So we're looking at that vol dot first. So we're still just looking at that one volume from 1976. Okay, so um, frequencies are nice, but maybe you are more interested in relative frequencies, right? So um, having a raw count might tell you less than knowing um, how many times a word occurs in relation to the other words in the volume. So we can do a little bit of division to help us figure out what the relative frequencies are. So we're dividing the number of appearances of the word uh, by the total number of words in the book. And it might take a second to run because now we're looping through every page. You had a question about um, how to aggregate pages. Now yeah. we're saying grab all the pages and um, tell us about relative frequency. Okay, so now we're getting things like the most frequently occurring words or relative, highest relative frequency are things like comma and the and of and 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 to and in. Okay, so again, probably not particularly helpful for us in figuring out what the salient topics of presidential speech in 1976 were, right? So we likely want to do a little bit of cleanup. But we're gonna do that next, I forgot. We're gonna make a plot first. Okay, so now let's plot uh, the most common tokens in the volume and their frequencies. <coughs> so now here we're seeing them on a nice pretty graph. So here we're seeing that the comma, rel this relative frequency is high, and then it sort of trickles down from there. Okay, but we don't care about the comma, do we? Okay, so we're going to use the stop words, um, uh, stop words that exist within NLTK. How many of you are familiar with NLTK? Okay, so NLTK is the Natural Language Toolkit. It's a Python library for um, doing text analysis. It's really helpful if you want a place to start the NLTK workbook, I feel like is a really um, beginner friendly way to both learn a little Python and learn a little bit about text analysis. But in this case, we're gonna use 
But then NLTK, we can grab a stop words list. So we want to use their standardized stop words list. Okay, so let's import it. We didn't do that at the beginning. Okay, and then we're bringing in the stop words list. So here they are. <coughs> so we're going to filter these. And then we're also going to filter the punctuation. So let's see what our data frame looks like if we get rid of those. So what are we seeing as common words? President, yeah. Anything else? So those words, President, 1976, knowing what we know about this volume, and then also looking at how much filtering we did. We filtered the stop words, but where, let's see if I can ask this question in, in an intelligible way. Where on these pages might, might we be finding words like president in 1976? Every page, right? In the header or maybe in the footer, right? So it's not particularly helpful for us to know this, is it? The president is the most frequently, has the highest relative frequency in a work that's called um, something, something U.S. presidents, right? Yeah, go ahead. I'm really sorry if you oh. already mentioned this, but did the Google Docs project not also, like, code the structure of the page? Like, they could use machine vision algorithms to figure out that President 1976 written the page header and footer. Is that not represented in the structure of the repository? No. Um, some of the volumes have information about, like, we think a chapter starts here, or we think a, like for a, a volume that has, um, oh, what is the word I want? What is that thing where they publish lots of short stories in one? Anthology. An anthology, right? Okay. So this is one work in an anthology. Um, there are some attempts to do that, but it's really messy and bad. Yeah. So it's a good question, but no, we don't have that data. Yeah. But this was pulled out in the process of making the extracted features files to say where the header is, where the body is, and where the footer is. So in this example, we're only looking at, um, let's see if we can get a good one. We're only looking at the tokens, and we didn't do any other filtering to um, narrow in on a page section. Wow, so that information is in there. It's in these extracted features files, yes. Okay. Sorry, I thought you meant when we get OCR from Google, do they tell us page section information? I didn't know what I was asking. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. So it is in these files. Okay. So we're seeing header, body, and footer. And the reason why we don't strip out the header or the footer, but we suggest where the separation might be, is because there's chances that we're wrong, because it's not scientific, it's just sort of like taking a scalpel and cutting off um, the first few lines of every page. And so some people might want to say, my works don't have headers or footers, so um, append it all together and that's my data. And some people will say, yeah, get rid of the header and the footer and only give me the body. Yeah. So now we're seeing, okay, so what it looks like if we get rid of stop words and what it looks like though if we're looking at the, the whole work. Okay, so now let's move from looking at the one volume to looking at all of the volumes in our set. <coughs> okay, so we can look at the most common words by word length. So, okay, so we'll run the first cell. And then I have 10 here, but try another number and see what the most common um, word by length is. I feel like this is being really funky. It must be counting it in a weird way, right? There's always two more than it says it's going to be. Am I it making that like up? It's giving you the most common yeah. noun in a volume, right? Not by the length. The length should be what's happening 
here. It's greater than equals to. This is the pitfalls of using somebody um, else's code. Because you hear Richard, he said it's, it's greater or equal to. Oh, 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 so yeah. Uh, here we go, yeah. So greater than or equal to. There we go, okay. So the most frequently occurring um, noun that is greater than or equal to that one. Yeah, it takes a village, right? Okay. In that case, if you give 15 there. Question and answer. Yeah, so yeah. why didn't we get that when we selected three? Because it's already greater than three, right? Yeah, that's a good question. There must be a cap, right? Because if, like, question and answer isn't as frequent as year. Oh, yeah, good point. Oh, uh, so other group is just taking place. Yeah. Like anything greater than three years, obviously going to be more common than question and answer. So if you, put in, if you put in zero, you should get the most common word. Yeah. Okay, so now we're looking at tokens across, we're still looking at tokens across all the volumes. So we run the next code block. Then we can see um, the relative frequency of one of our words across all of the volumes in our set. So remember before when we looked at nuclear, we were looking at just one volume or oil or run or whatever you chose or opportunity. Um, but in this case, we're looking at it across all of our volumes. So I'm gonna keep the nuclear example. Okay, so then, okay, we get the relative frequency, but then we can sort of mash these two things together. So you can try adding different words here again. So I can do oil. This takes a second to run. Thinking so hard. Did anybody get their sword? Mm -hmm. Go, go. Any questions while we wait? Is, yeah. is there a format um, where you can extract like the order text data? Yes, we'll talk about that next. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking about um, yesterday when you mentioned about um, words like female characters and female authors uh -huh. um, occurring before 1850 yes, yeah. and less, you know, after 1850, and you also mentioned the word creativity. Uh -huh. um, now, is it taking into account you know, the, the number of publications that it's relative to? Or is it in absolute numbers, meaning there may have been less published during a certain time period? So, so it's not like comparing apples and apples, but apples and tomatoes, or whatever. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So in this um, set that we're looking at, it's relative frequency either within one of the volumes we were looking at or only within our set. So like of the words in our volume, what is the relative frequency of that token? Yes, that's um, volume, but you mentioned years yesterday, right? Yes, and so in that project um, where they were looking at a bunch of years, then they had to make some um, assumptions about feeling like their set was representative of what was published in that year. So either with the creativity example, he was looking at all of the volumes that contained the word creative, so he scoped his set that way. Um, with the male and female characters, I think they looked at fiction published in between 1700 and 1920. So they did their best to approximate the landscape of fiction that was published in that time. Obviously there's limitations based on what has been digitized, so not everything would be digitized, um, but you're doing your best to make your set as comprehensive as possible. But that's one important reason why we moved from the raw count to the relative frequency because there is more 
there is more meaning inherent in the fact that of the relative frequencies than just knowing that it occurred a certain number of times. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I just wonder about there could be many pitfalls there. I mean, yeah. There's a lot to consider. Yeah, there is a lot to consider there. It's trying to make sure that you have scoped. Oh. scoped yeah. Okay, so now we've gotten our relative frequency of oil. Unfortunately, though, look, every one of our volumes is called public papers. This isn't particularly helpful. Where did we go? Okay, so let's make a scatter plot. Oh, no, I did the wrong one. We've got to do this code, code cell first. Okay, and then we can do the next one. So then we can see frequency see by year. I'm still using nuclear, but you can use whatever you want. And we'll make a scatter plot. So obviously it's like, oh, we're quickly up and running, but like it's pretty quick because we're reusing this code. But like really, truthfully speaking, we're up and running pretty quickly with making a visualization of the data, right? Um, so all things considered, even though it's so quick because we're just like clicking a button to reuse the pre-written code, um, even if you had to figure out how to write this yourself, the benefit of using something like the feature reader library is already programmed into it is the tokens and the token by page and the body and the header and the footer that will help you figure out how to um, um, pull a pull the data from within that file that is relevant to your work. Yeah. So this one takes a little while to go to. So is this feature reader library, is that what your colleague wrote or that's part of Python? Uh, what my what Peter wrote, yeah. And that can only be used on the Hathaways. <coughs> yes, yeah. So okay. the feature reader library goes hand in hand with the extracted features files, okay. yeah. Because um, they are specifically set to match this data format. Okay. Yeah. So here we have our pandas data frame, and then we have the relative frequency of nuclear in each of the volumes over time. In some years they published two. I don't know if it's because there was more and the volumes were eating fat and so there was two, but that's why you use, or three, so that's why you see some years we have more. But you can see sort of the relative upward trajectory through the 70s. It's not huge, but you can see the little one. Did anyone else try another, a different word? No. When you mentioned this package is written only particular for healthy, so does it mean only for digital collection in healthy or anti digital collection everywhere, like public libraries or that. It only works with the extracted features files. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just looking at the scatter plot data, I know that the 1971 is registering about 0.02, uh -huh. and the 79 is looking like 0 0.04, 0 0.05, maybe at a high point, 0 0.06. Yeah. That still represents a tripling of a relative frequency of the word nuclear yes. across that decade. Okay, so yes, good point. I minimized. I said a, a small trend, right? But that is a pretty significant change. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so it's, it's going up times three from the beginning of the decade through the end of the decade. So I was sure, sort of. Something very small is still something very small. <laughs> yeah, so I was being a little flippant, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it, it was tripling, which is significant. Yeah. Which do we have to consider factors like how many pages were in the in your particular engine? Uh, but we're looking at the relative frequency. Relative frequency is how many times the word nuclear was repeated out of every word. Is that right? Yes, yeah, for that year. So maybe if the number of pages were less in that particular edition, the frequency might increase. The relative frequency should account for that. Unless you're thinking that because they were saying fewer words overall, then they had <coughs> less opportunity to use the word? There might be less scan from 1971 than 79. Yes, but in this particular case, we're only looking at presidential papers of the U.S. presidents from the decade of 1970. So we've already really so already narrowed our focus, yeah. So we know that they're scanned. Mm -hmm. If we were doing something, uh, we probably won't have time to look at it, but there's a tool called Bookworm that does relative frequency over time in the entire digital library. And in that case, it's important to consider, oh yeah, you know, something, there might be scanning, weird scanning things, things like that. Okay, so let's do our last example here. Okay, so another way that we can make use, so we're moving away from the relative frequencies for this last one. So another thing that is beneficial to us about the structured file is um, that we can make use of that part of speech tag in an interesting way. So, oh, it's still loading. 
So here in this example, we'll, we're pulling out only the adjectives that occurred more than 50 times across all our volumes. So you could mess around with it. You could try pulling, replacing <coughs> the JJ uh, with another part of speech tag if you wanted to. Uh, you could change it. 50 is not quite an arbitrary choice, but I had played around with this and it had started to feel more meaningful. So you could play around with the number that you're pulling out. And then if you wanted to go back through this, sorry, try not to make anyone too seasick with the scrolling. If you wanted to play around with this um, notebook again, you'll see that preloaded is um, the public papers of US presidents from the 1930s. And so you could rerun the code using the 1930s data set, and you could see what differences you find between the two. Um, so if I remember right from the, well, I do remember right from the examples. Surprise, surprise, nuclear is not in the 1930s in the same way that we're seeing in the 70s. Um, they're talking, the 70s, I remember the 30s seems a little bit more like internal focus from other workshops that we've done analyzing them. So talking about like, um, like certain kinds of local policies or in the 70s it seems more internationally scoped. So if you wanted to, you could do some comparative work between those two sets. Okay, so why don't we take just a few minutes to stretch our legs and we'll start again at about 11.25. You can keep playing around with this and then we're gonna do the most fly-by look at the data capsules. I'm sure the rest of the I guess I'm just going to a large I guess I'm Yeah, up to the number. 
Uh, yeah, okay, so then open a new chat, and uh, you'll want to type in this part here. Yep, and then you have the option of choosing to grab the like, you know, we did so uh huh, and then fold. And then you put in what the ID type is and where you put the HTML. So, yeah, go back here. And here, put in HTML. And then at the very end, you need .js. Uh huh, yeah, it should work. Yep, okay, so. Yep, so you can basically Yeah, yeah, that's the metadata record for that volume. Mm -hmm. Yep, just for that one, yeah. No, no, this was just an example. One, to get used to this idea of the. Um, the volume ID as something that's useful for pulling up more information and to get to a fresh starting But yeah, this is just for pulling up metadata and not for pulling up text data. Yeah. Yeah, here. So it's um, a, it's, a bibliographic metadata, so it's marked, so library metadata, rendered in JSON. So yeah, it's a little weird. Uh, it's common. Oh, sorry. So that it works for the structure, by the way, to come to the background. Well, it looks like it's stuck on something. So see that um, that star there? That means it's still processing. So it's somewhere along the way. Uh, something is still processing, so you'll want to wait. Some of them take a while to like process, and you can also, if you get stuck, you can do kernel um, restart and clear output, and you can start again from the top. Yeah, but it looks like something is lagging. It's it's stuck and still running. Yeah, if you hit stop, you can also. Yeah, that will interrupt it. See what happens. Okay, and then we try rerunning that one. I'm not sure exactly where I got stuck. Okay. Especially as a beginner. Okay, let's get back together. Okay, so um, let's come back to our Sam example. So uh, remember when we left Sam, he had made his list of volume IDs. So then Sam used rsync. How many of you are familiar with rsync? How many of you are familiar with like F FTP, SFTP? Okay, so rsync is a file transfer protocol. Um, it is, I'm not gonna like nerd out on why people like it. It's efficient, it does certain things, but basically it's just a, a way of running a command on the command line to download data. It's just a way to download. So it's a download protocol. So you use rsync on the command line, you say rsync, and then you make pointers to whatever you want, and then the thing is downloaded to your computer. And that's how you get the extracted features files. So Sam rsynced um, the extracted features files for his reduced volume ID list. And then he narrowed his corpus only to those individual pages that contained some form of creative. So he got rid of every page where creative didn't appear. And then he kept only the meaningful tokens. So he got rid of pronouns and conjunctions. There's a term of art for this that um, I won't, it's not, yeah, anyway. So he, he kept the meaningful ones. So things like adjectives, the nouns, the proper nouns, the verbs, and decided that the other words were less meaningful for his analysis. And then he performed topic modeling on those pages. And then this is what he ends up with. 
So he finds that these are these aren't all of the topics that fall in usage through the century, but this is just a subset of them. But here are some of the ones that um, fall in usage over the 20th century. So um, the topics and see it's the topic is just the lump of the words. We I didn't name them, um, and I can't remember if in his chapter Sam names them either. But they relate to things like um, religious usage, um, natural usage, like animals and plants, uh, nature and mind, and also invention, power, ideas. And then we see an uptick in topics where creative occurs around things like advertising and media, economics, poetry, um, and literature, and then things like social and, um, beha social and behavioral studies. So um, Sam, using these um, topics, the way that he was able to map the relative frequencies of the topics, made the argument that over time in the 20th century, there's a spike. He knew there was a spike. But within that spike of the word creativity, um, he found that usage of the word creative became more related to imagina imagination than to generation. So where I had been like, you know, you are creating something, then it becomes something about like the creative process is sort of that like artistic or intellectual thing. Okay, we did our break. Okay, so the entire extracted feature set is four terabytes, so don't start the download on your laptop unless you have that much space. Um, you'll want to download what you need. So I think there was some confusion when we were doing the activities about whether we were playing with all of the extracted features. We had worked with only a subset. Um, so you'll need to know the rsync path. That's another form of structured URL, just like the um, um, bib API, but the URL is a little different. So basically, once you have your volume IDs, Feature Reader has this handy built-in utility to go from volume ID to rsync path. So you say, I forget what the command is, but it's something like ID to rsync path. And you can run that on the command line once you have this installed. And it will spit out all the paths that you need. And then you say, OK, I have the paths. And now let me um, write a little script to um, rsync those files, or rsync one file at a time. OK, they will come to you in pear tree format. I won't belabor this. Pear tree format is something that the University of California Digital Library uses, CDL, um, and also others. But it's apparently efficient. So what you'll find is that the folders and files are really nested. So the directories are highly nested. So when you open it up, you'll see like extracted features, and then you'll see like MDP, UC1, HVD, and then you'll click, and then you'll see like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then you click, and then you keep clicking, and you keep clicking, and eventually you end up at the file. Um, you can, if you're so interested, pull out all of the files into a single directory. But apparently, people who work with lots of these files like the nested hierarchy, because if you are working with millions or several hundreds of thousands of these files, then you want to keep that really um, well-contained directory structure. I don't know enough about like the ins and outs of computers to know about the nuances here. But people like it, so it is the way it is. Some people hate it, but um, some people like it. OK, so let's look at the data capsules uh, before we wrap up for the day. <sighs> okay, so HTRC data capsules. So uh, you asked the question, what about word order? Okay, so we've sort of worked through our hoops. We, I mentioned the algorithms, and if you so choose, you can play with the algorithms in a second. But that's sort of like the entry level, um, no access to the text data, but access to a tool and your results. And then we have the extracted features files, which you have the benefit of the flexibility of working on your own machine, but the constraint of the file format. And then within the data capsule, you have the flexibility to do whatever analysis you want, whatever computational analysis you want, but the constraint of working within the specific system, so not on your own hard drive. So you work with the HathiTrust corpus in a secure environment that mimics your own desktop. So here I am in a web browser. And then in my web browser, I'm looking at an Ubuntu desktop. So if you've ever remote access to computer, that's essentially what you're doing here. But your machine lives at IU in this case. So it's a secure virtual machine. And it's for researchers who need more flexibility and also don't want any hand-holding. So 
There's no, we'll, if we have time, we'll look at a way for you to do some quick topic modeling in there. That's just one example, but if you wanted to do more, you would have to be ready to program and write your own code, which some people want. Okay, so secure environment for non-consumptive analysis. There's two modes. So this is part of the security piece, maintenance and secure. In maintenance mode, you have access to the network, to the internet, so you can install any text analysis tool that you want. In secure mode, you no longer have network access, but your pipeline to the data opens up. So you get your computing environment set up the way you want it, and then you bring in your data and do your work. Uh, okay, so within this framework, we come back to the non-consumptive use policy. Um, so remember these capsules are for computational text analysis. Um, so part of that is the understanding that sometimes you need to check the text to see. Um, so there is that interplay, but they are set up for that and not set up as a platform for, um, for reading volumes from the digital library. There is a terms of use agreement that is an agreement between um, Hathi Trust, Hathi Trust Research Center, and the researcher. And these are four of the terms from those terms of use that you agree to when you get a capsule, which basically says you're going to comply by our policy, you're only going to use it for these non-consumptive use uh, purposes. Um, that you're going to tell us about your use and that you acknowledge that um, we may be watching you. But in a way that's consistent with the Hodge Trust Privacy Policy. Okay, so here's maintenance mode again. We have our network, no data API access. Here's our secure mode, no network, access to the data. So you toggle between the two of them as you go about your work. Okay. Da, 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 da. We're skipping quickly through these. Okay, so pre-installed in every capsule are some HDRC developed tools, including the feature reader. I don't know why I shouldn't say that. So <coughs> out of turn. You may or may not want to use the feature reader library in a data capsule. Might not be the intended use case, but maybe you want to use the extracted features files there. Uh, but you also have access to a library called the Workset Toolkit, and the Workset Toolkit is critical because it's what allows you to talk to the data API. So you don't have to write any special like API request. You don't have to um, formulate your query in a certain way, but you just type in HDRC download and then the volumes that you would like to pull into your capsule. And that could be in the form of a list of volume IDs. It could be in the form of a HathiTrust collection. You could give it the URL and then it will move those in for you. And then there's also some general data science-y libraries that are pre-installed so that um, every researcher doesn't have to start again and install the same tools. Um, someone asked yesterday if these are the only tools you can use, and no, if there's another tool or something that you wrote when you're in maintenance mode with your internet connection, then you can bring that tool in too. Okay, this is more stuff that's pre-installed, Mallet, <coughs> R, Anacondas in there. Okay, there's two kinds of capsules. Let's move to the demo. Okay, so I'm gonna escape. And you're gonna follow along with me up to a point. And then you're gonna bail and decide whether you want to continue on this path or choose your own adventure. Okay, so let's go to the data capsules. Sign in, I have to sign in again. Okay, so I already have three capsules. You will have a limit of the number of capsules. Is everyone logged in? Mm -hmm. Okay, you'll have a limit on the number of capsules that you can create. I think that there, so there's a, both a number in terms of like sheer number of capsules, which I think is three. And then there's also a space limitation. And so you can't have more than, and I'd have to look back at the documentation, but like, let's say 20 gigs of space and a certain amount of vCPUs allocated to yourself. So I won't, I won't go through the full creation process. But if you click create a capsule, then you'll get taken to a <coughs> screen where you can choose to make a demo capsule or a research capsule. The demo capsules are the tiniest available machine, um, access only to the public domain content, and you can't export any of your results. So these are good for the person who's like, let's see what this thing does. 
Um, and then you think that you're going to go back and restart your project for real at some point. Or in the classroom, this could be a good way to have people explore it. We'll be using the demo capsules together. Uh, there's also the research capsule. Here you have more um, opportunity to set the parameters for your capsule, but you also have to give us more information. So you have to tell us the title of your research project. You have to choose an image. So you can either choose that your um, the disk image that you're getting, so your version of the capsule, whether it comes preloaded with sample volumes or not. Some people like them there to explore, some people don't care to have them there. You choose the number of vCPUs between 2 and 4, the um, gigabytes of memory that you want between 4 and 16. You describe your research. You tell us what outside data you plan to incorporate. So let's say you wanted to look at how to trust data in um, conjunction with other data, then this is where you have the opportunity to do that in a capsule. Um, you can provide links to any web accessible documentation, tools, or code that you plan to use. And then if you want to request access to a capsule that has full corpus capabilities, you check this box and then you tell us why. Like, why do you need that? Um, there's a little, a few more fields here. What do you expect to export? Um, and how do you intend to use your results? The questions both help the reviewer of your data release um, know what to expect. So if you say, oh, I'm expecting to release CSV files, and they're going to have a header row that's going to say this sort of thing, and the information is structured in that way, it helps with the release process. Um, but it's also to um, look for understanding and compliance with our policy. If you don't check this box and you fill out the form, then you go on your merry way and you create your research capsule. If you do check the box, then when you hit fill everything out and check the boxes here and you hit create capsule, your capsule, um, I can't remember if it doesn't appear or doesn't appear as a full research capsule until someone on our team reviews your requests and approves it. And these full capsules are only available right now to affiliates of member institutions. And so at the University of Cincinnati, then this is available to you as members of that community. But we do uh, review the request um, to see that there's a demonstrated use there. OK, so you can create a demo capsule. Demo capsule should be the fastest way to do it without filling out all that information. And then see if you can follow the, actually, I don't want to create a demo capsule. You want to create a demo capsule, but I'm going to open my, um, my test one here. OK, and then see if you can follow the instructions on page, does anyone know what page we're on? Six of the handout to pull in some data and automatically feed it to the an, uh, topic modeling tool called Info and look at your results. If you're not interested in the data capsule and this already feels terrifying because you don't know how to work on the command line and you're like, oh, then I would recommend going out of the data capsule tab and running the topic modeling algorithm. So those are your two choices. Um, do it in the data capsule but feel comfortable working on the command line for uh, one command or two, uh, run the algorithm for topic modeling. Are there any questions about that? Okay. And the directions follow one after the other in your handout. Yeah. I have another on my command line. You have what? Uh, yeah, so you'll need to, so, are you in maintenance mode? Okay, so you're in maintenance mode. No, I'm just trying to check if I'm in maintenance mode or not. Yep, it looks like it, right? I am trying to run this command. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, so not on the command line, but check here. Oh. Yeah. So you are in maintenance mode, so then start here. Okay. Yeah.
Yeah, I'll give you a couple more minutes. Yeah. Oh. 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 Oh
Did anybody get results? Mine's still not pending. Did you refresh the page? No, because I thought that would restart it. No. Maybe because we all so hit it at once. Yeah, to this yeah. one. Yeah. Okay. Or this one right here on the bottom left. It's still thinking? Right here. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I just click on that. And going. Okay. Okay. It's the future. Okay, well, let's pause and then we can come back to your results as they're loading. <laughs> oh, just time over. Well, I would go. I usually, I usually go here. I mean, there's a bunch of ways to get to your command. Okay, so while we're waiting for data to import or jobs to run, we can look at one example of a group that uh, did do research in a data capsule. So, um, a group of researchers from the University of Iowa last year worked on a project where they were trying to figure out whether the time spent at the Iowa Writers Project influenced the style of the author's writing. And so they assembled a corpus of um, works that were published by um, alumni of that program, and then they did some analysis. So you can imagine that there's constraints, constraints in place here because you know, the graduates of this program were publishing within the last, you know, I don't can't remember how far back they went, but they're relatively recent works. So working within a capsule, they were able to perform analysis to see whether there is a workshop style. They collected different metrics about vocabulary size, addiction, and sentence length. And then they're um, using all of the data that they generated in the capsule to then build a website that they're going to publish at Iowa that will allow people to explore the um, nuances of the Iowa style. And so you'll see the way that working with, this is a perfect model for working within the data capsules because they needed access to a certain subset of data that wasn't otherwise available to them. They performed computational analysis. They came up with results that are not a substitute for human reading. It's metadata about vocabulary size, sentence length. And then they're using that outside of the capsule to feed into another um, project that they're working on. Okay, so you can play with Bookworm on your own because we're not going to have time today. I have this chronic anxiety that I didn't prepare enough materials, so um, we're not going to do Bookworm, but you're welcome to play with it on your own. I do, before we come back around to the um, uh, example you were just working on, want to mention before we wrap up that the HTRC, not quite annually, but almost annually, does um, this program called Advanced Collaborative Support. And this is a program of grants, not in uh, money, but in time and compute resources uh, for researchers who want to do a project that relies on data from HathiTrust or on um, HTRC tools or expertise in order to accomplish uh, what the person wants to do. Uh, so we've done three rounds. We're about to start the fourth. Um, Sam was an ACS awardee. The nice part about these projects is that, that we work with the people closely, so I know the most about their work. Uh, so Sam was an ACS awardee. The Iowa PEP project was an ACS awardee. Uh, but we're about to issue the next request for proposals in the next week or two. And so um, they are structured so that they um, will be accepted if they come from a researcher at a HathiTrust member institution, or at least one person on the team is from a member institution. So this is a benefit that is available to you at the University of Cincinnati because your university has signed on to HathiTrust. Um, so we would love to see um, applications from folks here. If you have a project where you feel like the tools that I covered today don't cut it, or you feel like you want to do something that um, would require you to have access to different compute resources, um, then you would be, um, you could apply, and if you get awarded, then you have dedicated staff time um, and the ability to do things like uh, run um, certain processes on the cluster at IU on some of the um, larger secure servers. Yeah? What's the turnaround time on the completion for the project grant? Yeah, so in the past, we have said six months. Um, we have never finished an ACS round in six months. So this next year, we're doing a year <laughs> because it seems more reasonable. Yeah. So the projects will run from June 2019 through the end of May 2020. You could always finish before that, um, but they are, um, we're allocating a year for that cycle. Okay, so let's reverse. Did anybody get results from what they were trying to do, either in the capsule? Yeah, go ahead. 
but I do not understand how to interpret that. Okay, so you probably got a bubble graph like this. So let me escape out of here. I will mention here <coughs> that there is nice um, documentation at info, I-N-P-H-O dot github dot I-O about how to read the visualization. So I pulled it up because it's helpful for me to refresh my memory. Okay, so the colors are not meaningful except that they um, demonstrate straight, um, the, the color, like red doesn't mean anything special versus blue. Like red doesn't mean hot and blue means less frequently occurring. So they are set by the algorithm. And um, you also, let me show you what I have here. So here in my example, I only ran the command with, um, is it dash K 200? So this is a 200 topic model. So I created 200 topics where K is the number of topics I wanted to create. Um, if I had done it with, um, I actually don't, there is a way where you can, when you run the command, you could do uh, multiple iterations of the versions of the topics. And also you can do that in the algorithm when you, if you run it from the um, analytics algorithm. And in that case, you would see different size bubbles so I don't know if anybody got that far, but you would see um, different size bubbles that had to do with the number of topics that you created in that run. And so, so then when you hover over, you see the words that occurred in that topic. Yeah. So I have given a, uh, what is the title uh, which I want to select in the command line. Uh -huh. And then uh, I go up, every page popped up and I selected topic and gave the, so the book I picked was like, a, Kids violence in 99s or something. Uh -huh. So I gave the topic name as kids. Okay. I mean the word name. Yes. So a bunch of bubbles popped up. What does that <coughs> even represent? I don't know. Yeah, so this is representing um, each topic represents words that um, co occur, by which I don't mean like directly next to one another, but occur near one another within your set of your data set. So that could be, it sounds like you did just one volume, but this was looking at a collection of volumes. And so within that collection of volumes, which I think had something to do with like um, energy and like the, um, I should look back up, hold on. Let's see what I actually looked at. Oh, 1860s British and American Photography Periodicals. I'm glad I pulled this up again because it's actually probably a bad one, the topic model. Okay, but we can see within that collection that there is a topic of words that tend to co-occur, occur, which include things like um, quadrant, shrimps, Kona, lanai, daily molecule, which is probably like a like some kind so of shellfish. Hawaiian Island. Oh, there we go. Okay, a Hawaiian Island. Okay, so these topics are not good topics, right? So don't use this as a good example. But these are words that tended to occur within the same space as each other in the data set. And I think it's looking at a page at a time because that's how the data gets loaded in. So it's saying the logic here is that words that occur near one another in a body of text tend to be about the same topic because that's how we write. So like now I'm talking about Hawaii and now I'm talking about the state of Washington. And so those topics should cluster together within the text. The pitfall is that sometimes, and I bet this might be what's happening here, is that if you're looking at like really disparate things, maybe there's like one set of periodicals that are all about Hawaii and another set of periodicals that are all about the state of Washington, for example, you might end up with topics that just relate to those things. And that's not actually useful because you could have known that just by knowing that you had volumes about those topics that you put into your data set. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, will there be a parameter to control the length? I mean, what's the distance between the two words occurring or something? <coughs> yeah, so the, um, some keys that you want to look out for when you're thinking about like whether something is a good example for topic modeling. So one example that I've seen that I think was particularly persuasive was looking at 19th century fiction. So they got everything that they could get their hands on for 19th century fiction, and then they pulled the most frequently occurring topics within that set. And then they said, okay, 
we think that there is a topic of female fashion because there tends to be words that co-occur that are things like lace and muslin and skirt. And so that gives you an idea that during that time period they were writing about that topic. Yeah, so each one of these represents a topic within our model. Yeah. Is there any other questions? Yeah, Claire. Between topic bubbles, uh -huh. is that distance like gravity, like distance, is that distance relative or <coughs> relevant? Yeah, the, the um, closeness of the bubbles has to do with, yeah, how um, distinct the topics were from one another in the text. So in this one, we're just seeing a big clump, which further proves to me that either I need to rejigger my input and choose a different number of topics, or that my data set was a bad candidate for topic modeling, um, and the topics are not going to be distinct enough from one another to get anything useful out of it. Yeah. Are there any other questions? So this isn't the only way to use a capsule. This is just one way that you can very quickly feed data in and make a visualization. Um, you ran the command that was, and I'll stop in a second because I know we're over time. Uh, you ran the command that went HTRC topic explore yada yada yada. If you did HTRC download, then that would just move the data in without piping it to the visualization. Okay, so I understand that we have lunch now, so I'm around to answer questions during lunch. I'm also around to answer questions by email, but otherwise I want to make sure to let you go because we are over time. Amy might have a few wrap up words. That was amazing. Thank you so much. I would say. It was great to have the Hockey Trust actually come to the University of Cincinnati and do a talk like this in a workshop. We so really appreciate you coming to Thank UC. You. Yeah. Um, I wanted to also let people know that there is another event in our, I'm sorry, in our, in our series, March 12th. It's going to be, um, we're going to have someone from the um, National Center for Supercomputing Applications come and do a workshop on scientific visualization using a, a software, an open source software called Visit. So sign up on the, on the one stop and come back and have another great event like this. Um, lunch is served in the back um, and Shima Wong, our dean, is here. So if you want to say hello to the dean, um, I'm going to introduce Eleanor to the dean as well. So enjoy the lunch and thanks for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.